Alors, euh, Jean-Benoît, bonjour, bon, merci d'être là, Jean-Benoît. Est-ce que tu pourrais euh, commencer à, à partager? Euh... Ben oui, certainement. Puis peut-être euh, pour une... Oh, in English, of course. Yes. Sorry. I'd be, It's actually I'd be much easier for me, in English. Um, although I grew up in Saint-Bruno de Montarville. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the emerging uh, Nova Scotia wine industry, um, I would say a surprising proposition to begin with, and maybe I'll give a uh, two-minute introduction to why there is an emerging uh, wine region, why that proposition uh, came to be. So, it relies as a foundation on uh, the proximity and the presence of the Bay of Fundy which is a really unique entity in the natural world. It has the highest and strongest tides on the face of the planet. The water goes up and down 18 meters a day. Um, and as it goes up and down, it pushes an incredible amount of moderated air. There is more water, just to illustrate the strength and the magnitude of uh, the Bay of Fundy, there's more water going through the bay on a daily basis than all the freshwater rivers of the world combined. And so it is the definition of a force to be reckoned with And it's, um, um, it's a pretty linear logic, kind of a, a cause-to-effect proposition. There is uh, an ecosystem, a microclimate, and a growing environment surrounding the Bay of Fundy that is equally as unique as the Bay is in the natural world, and it's perfectly suited for traditional method sparkling. So in this context, it is relevant to talk about Nova Scotia as a cool climate on a climatic spectrum. Um, um, uh, we are... Um, similar to some microclimates in the UK, we are cooler than Champagne. Um, probably climatically similar to Champagne 35 years ago, more or less, you know, if uh, we had to generalize. And so the question when it comes to cool climates, uh, you know, such as Nova Scotia, is what is there to lose and what's in jeopardy, what's at stake? Um, maybe I'll start with a little anecdote. I was talking to a grape grower. Um, Uh, actually, uh, only 48 hours ago, and he also happens to be an engineer specializing in harbors, and he was saying that um, all the harbors in Nova Scotia uh, could disappear within the next 50 years. Like, that's crazy. And if we think about, you know, a stereotype, an aesthetic stereotype, you know, to define the Maritimes, I think of all these fishing communities. Well, the problem is that, you know, like if the sea level rises significantly, there will just not be enough financial resources, uh, you know, to cater, uh, you know, to these specialty needs uh, that will be popping up left and right. So not 100% wine related, but definitely a, um, an illustration of how we are moderated, we are created, we are made possible by the Bay of Fundy. And obviously, uh, you know, the rising water levels are going to have a huge impact. Um, I'm often asked by journalists uh, if I'm excited about climate change because there is this, um, um, maybe this, this stereotype in the collective unconscious that um, um, cool climates, you know, such as Quebec and Nova Scotia can use some heat units, um, especially during the growing season. That, that, that is, that's wrong. <laughs> that's not... Um, That's not true, like that's fundamentally inaccurate. Uh, obviously it's an aberration. And the reason for that is because we are precisely specializing in traditional method sparkling because we can elongate the growing season based on the moderating effects of the Bay of Fundy during the growing season. So we're not looking for additional heat units. Plus, um, again, kind of speaking of stereotypes, uh, obviously Nova Scotia is not tied you know, to a warm climate by any stretch of the imagination, but Um, the moderating effect of the Bay of Fundy is so profound in our little valley that goes straight into the bay. So it turns it into a channel or a corridor of moderation. And so the winter temperatures never really go down below minus 15. So we never had um, to um, uh, implement like any um, uh, special viticultural techniques such as you know, geotextile or you know, the burying of the vines or anything like that. Um, which can be a surprise, I'm assuming, to some, um, let alone that there is a wine industry in Nova Scotia. So, um, traditional method sparkling, obviously a match made in heaven. We harvested uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir last week. Uh, and so, if you are wondering if we have 
you know, not only the ability to compensate for the fact that the growing season starts a little bit later, but that we can stretch it and tap into a tremendous amount of hang time while the proof is in the pudding. Um, I think, you know, the harvest dates for traditional method sparkling are around, um, what, like the last week of July now in Sonoma County. So even if we do start, you know, like uh, our growing season later, um, obviously we can catch up and more. And that is at stake because as a byproduct of uh, um, climate change and global warming, what we've seen, and, uh, you know, like it's, it's very linear, right, uh, is that, you know, like harvest dates have been more and more premature in Champagne. Um, and it's a little bit like a crystal ball, right? So we've seen harvest dates that are premature, but in conjunction with, you know, like acidity levels that are more conducive to making extra brute than brute nature, uh, you know, as opposed to harvest dates that were, uh, you know, further into the growing season and into the fall in the past, in conjunction with historical wines, you know, that would receive a dosage, you know, like uh, over 10 grams per liter, and that was, you know, perfectly in balance. So, um, so that's that. Um, maybe Thank just as a little yeah, go snapshot. Ahead. We're going to go to Francisco, but I just have one quick question before we go to Francisco. Um, I know that uh, you work from time to time with Pascal Grappard, uh, and you're talking about champagne. Um, how does he see the difference uh, between when he comes and, and tastes your wine? Does he say, well, perhaps we have to uh, plant more vines here? Or does he make a correlation between the difference between what he's experiencing and what you're experiencing in, with the climate change? Well, there's no question that, you know, like uh, Champagne is under a tremendous amount of scrutiny and, you know, it is universally recognized, right, that there are climatic changes, um, you know, like at play. Um, and then as far as the differences between the two, um, you know, like Nova Scotia and Champagne, I would say that um, it would still be of the view that our acidity, you know, like uh, needs to be relatively tamed, uh, whether that, you know, is malolactic fermentation, um, um, or, you know, like delayed harvest dates. So finding the richness, you know, like is still like very much an objective. Thank you. We'll come back to you in a, in a second. Francisco? Thank you, Michel. Um, as Jean Benoit, I'm coming from Nova Scotia. Well, of course, my accent, I'm Chilean, but I'm coming from Nova Scotia as well. And I would like to give you a brief introduction of what is Nova Scotia. It's one of the maritime provinces here in Canada. It's surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. And it's very interesting to see then Nova Scotia is located like in the latitude 45, similar to Bordeaux region. However, we have some differences. We have a very cool climate. We have a snowy winters and the season is quite short. If we start to compare only the bad birds, for example, in, in Bordeaux, it's happening like at the end of, of March, beginning of April. Meanwhile, in Nova Scotia, it's happening like at the end of May or sometimes even at the beginning of June. So we can see some differences with both uh, areas. The climate change, well, as is happening in many different areas all around the world, is affecting Nova Scotia. Um, and the best example is how has been changing the varieties there. Like, until like the 60s, we didn't have almost, or we didn't have a Vitis vinifera, the European grapes. So it's only until the end of the 70s, beginning of 80s, then the starts the first trials, quite serious, but we didn't have positive results. The vines, they were usually or dying, or if they were surviving, they were with serious damage. Nowadays, which is very surprising for us in the province, we are growing Vitis vinifera. It's not uh, unusual for us to see Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Noir, or even Sauvignon Blanc growing in our province, and they're growing successfully and producing wines. And nowadays represents the 20% of the surface in, in our region. Of course, we have some challenges now. The winters and the, the frost at spring or at, uh, at autumn they are affecting equally both hybrids and Vitis vinifera varieties. Uh, that can diminish our free frost period, so we have some damage. Also, what, we are, what is happening is highly precipitations, sampling times that we were not expecting. So we're increasing erosions in some areas. 
The soil profile is full of water, so the nutrients are less available for the plants. Again, both for hybrids and Vitis vinifera. And we have some unpredictable events, climatic events. For example, in September, we have a hurricane in Nova Scotia. So blow away a lot of the canopy of the plant. So we have negative effects. But I have to admit, the grape growers are quite wise in, in Nova Scotia. Because all this time, they have been doing some trial and error. So they have discovered that they have to be very close to large bodies of water. So this can diminish the fluctuations of temperature in winter. So it's not so low. Also, they are choosing certain altitudes in a way that they can extend the, the growing season. So they can skip or avoid the, the spring frost and extend a little bit in fall. Also, they are choosing the south exposure because in that way they can be more efficient with the sunlight. So they can ripe better the, the, the fruit. And again, I will say Bordeaux because as many other regions are all around the world, here we have or we need to put tile drainage. So there, the vineyards, they have tile drainage. Uh, the growers, they have been copying this in a very clever way and using very nice varieties. So we continue improving. Uh, in the last three years in Perenia uh, Food and Agriculture, we have developed a, a serious terroir study. And when I say terroir study, is uh, really serious, as Miguel Torres was explaining before. We're taking some different locations and doing a deep analysis of what is happening with the climate, with the soil, with the cultural practices, and also with the varieties, with thinking in a specific winemaking. Okay, so after all this study, we have developed some solutions. And I will mention only a couple for you. First of all, one good solution is to increase the plant density. So if we can increase the amount of plants per hectare or acre, we can grow plants with more balance, and we can diminish the production per plant. So the fruit will be more qualitative, and we have more uh, characteristics. Also, we are suggesting also to put some different cover crops, so we can diminish the erosion, and also the plant can grow with more balance. Some cultural practices, like for example, uh, Mr. Torres was explaining not to do a canopy management or don't take a lot of leaf from the fruit zone, well, here we are encouraging to do it because we can increase the aeration, we can increase the sunlight, so we can enhance the production of new aromas, flavors, and also diminish the fungal disease. What means that? Then we can use less attractor and use less the fungicide, which can have an environmental uh, friendly impact. Um, finally, and as Jose explained this uh, morning as well, is the selection of the proper grapevines. So choosing the proper variety, the proper clone, and the proper rootstock in different areas, and thinking in which type of wine we, can, uh, we want to achieve will be crucial for a region where, where it's in, a, in the extreme of winemaking. Just to conclude, I'm almost done, Michelle. Uh, but but I, can, I, I know the time. Uh, Nova Scotia, its part in this world of the climate change has been impacting. Uh, and we are coping with all the challenges and we are aware of all the opportunities that that is bringing to us. So grape growers, they have been choosing a very clever pos uh, places with a nice uh, slope, with a nice sun, uh, sun exposure and in certain lati altitudes. Also with the contribution of new cultural management practices and choosing the proper cover, cover crop will help. And moreover, if we can choose the proper variety, clone, and rootstock, we can, we can continue producing and achieving specific wines. So overall, all these facts together, they can give the opportunity to the wine growing region of Nova Scotia to continue improving and developing in the future. Merci. Grégory Viennois, c'est à votre tour. <coughs> So uh, Chablis is uh, located between uh, Paris and and Bonn. That means that means it's uh, more uh, continental uh, than uh, than Bonn. What what we uh, we we can observe and uh, is uh, it's faster and faster. Uh, it's uh, the date of harvest are uh, more precocious than uh, than before. So usually uh, uh, a normal uh, date of harvest in Chablis it's uh, uh, started in uh, fall, end of September, beginning of October. 
So uh, since 03, 2003, we, we, uh, we can see a huge changement. And uh, since 2000, that means uh, if I, I can give you some uh, uh, data for us, uh, in uh, 2017, we, we started uh, the uh, 1st of September. Uh, 2018, we started uh, the uh, 28th of August. It was the first time we started in, uh, in August. So that means it's not linear, because in uh, 2019, we, we started the 10th of, of September, but uh, definitely it's more uh, precocious uh, than, uh, than before. So it's a fact, uh, but I think we, we, there is a lot of hope, uh, and I think in the, in the notion of uh, the global notion of terroir, there is uh, human uh, practices, and we have to adapt uh, ourselves. And it was uh, the same case before, because uh, when uh, the first uh, uh, monks in, uh, in Burgundy uh, start to, to try different varieties, they, uh, they uh, planted the Chardonnay in, uh, in Chablis, but uh, some Pinot Noir in Irancy and the Pinot, that means there is some adaptation and uh, we need to, to accept to do this. So what, what we, we can see also, that means uh, it's what we do we have to take care of the soil, and I think it's the main uh, important uh, thing for us. And we can see uh, that it works. It needs a lot of time, because there is no answer after uh, one year. That means we, we need to wait, but it works. Uh, we work uh, here at La Roche, we, we work with, uh, uh, with a lot of uh, massive uh, uh, bringing of, uh, of uh, organic matter. So that means we try to create a very uh, uh, a huge uh, complex uh, of uh, clay and, uh, and humus. And that means it's very reactive to, to, uh, for the uh, water retention. And it works well. That means we, we can see that uh, the, uh, it works like, uh, like a sponge and it works well during the, uh, the summer because our summer is uh, warmer and warmer. So it works. But it's not enos. That means we, we, we work with, uh, with green manure also. That means we, we use uh, some uh, oats, some, uh, um, some uh, so, uh, Chinese radish uh, also, you know? Chinese, uh, Chinese radish, okay? Because it's a pivot root. That means you work uh, against uh, decompaction. So what, what we have to do is uh, to, to, uh, to try to to use many different things. We have to reduce uh, our uh, treatment. That much, that's why uh, we, it's more global. Our management needs uh, to be global, and it's very important. There is a new certification in France. It's a high environmental value. And I think it's, uh, it's good because we, we take care about uh, the environment, about what we, we do in the soils, uh, about uh, the water we, we, we use, all the resources. And I think it's a, it's a good management of our uh, activity. Just on that, just because it was quite controversial this morning, uh, I believe you used to be organic and you moved to uh, sustainable practices, including H uh, HVE. Um, yeah. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, because uh, so for me, it's not or green or, or, or white or black. That means we, we have to adapt and to observe. And uh, so organic, uh, <coughs> it's a, a good certification, but for me, it's not enough. That means we, we have to manage with more parameters. And uh, what I can see is that uh, we have to take care of uh, our soil, but if we, we have to, to, uh, to, to spray uh, 17 or 19 uh, uh, times per, per year, uh, there is no sense because we have a huge compaction of our soil. That means we need to manage with uh, all the parameters. And uh, it works with, uh, it's more a philosophy, and it's why we work with agroecological philosophy. And that's, I think it's important because uh, it's, uh, it's more, uh, more complex for me. Thank you. José, you missed the beginning. So do I need to explain what's going to happen? <laughs> so, José, um, you're here to talk about, you have your Switzerland hat, um, so if you could uh, talk to us a little bit about Switzerland. Yes, with pleasure. I prepared a few slides, do you have them? Oui. 
I think it could be more convenient. It was supposed to be in the PowerPoint, but he didn't hear the memo. I'm just teasing. <laughs> there it is. Uh, maybe I, I will need the, uh, the pointer. Can I have the pointer? Uh, I think it's over there, yeah. <clears throat> Should I stand or? No? Okay. Merci. So yeah, <clears throat> uh, I prepared a few slides to, to speak about the situation in Switzerland, as Michel asked me, uh, and more generally in the Alps region. A um, few words, it's going to take 10 minutes just to give you a general picture of the situation. A few words about, about uh, viticulture in, in, in Switzerland. So I'm going to sit. Um, we have six different wine regions in Switzerland, and uh, we have approximately 15,000 hectares, which is similar to Alsace, for example. So we are a tiny, tiny country. But on this tiny country, uh, we cultivate grapes and wine, and we only export 1% of what we produce. That's why you probably will not find Swiss wines abroad very often. You need to, to go uh, in the country to, to have them. And we import 65% of what we drink, because we drink a lot. And um, <clears throat> it, it's a good example of, uh, of uh, diversity and, and heroic viticulture. I showed you these pictures, as you can see here. Um, we have steep vineyards and a high cost of labor and high cost of, uh, of, of people working as well. So for comparison, some of these vineyards, very steep vineyards, require 1,500 hours per hectare per year. For comparison, Bordeaux is approximately 300. We should be five times more expensive than Bordeaux, and we're not, not yet. Um, because it's, it's really, really expensive to grow grape and to make wine in Switzerland. We have dry stone walls, we have historical vineyards, but we, we uh, are struggling to make good wines out of it. On top of it, we are a bit crazy in terms of biodiversity. In a climate change world, it's good to have such a diversity to play with. But in this case, I think it's too much. We have, I, I, I counted 252 grape varieties that are cultivated in, uh, in Switzerland to make wine. It, it's crazy, it's too much. Um, and out of these varieties, 168 are admitted, authorized in appellation. It, it's, I think it's, it's too much. So I made three categories of Swiss wines. Uh, on the right side, you have what I called allogenous. They come from abroad, including Syrah, Nebbiolo, and so on. The traditional ones that were in, in, introduced before 1900, before Phylloxera, Pinot, uh, Gamay, etc. And the indigenous ones, those that were born in Switzerland. We have heritage varieties, 21 of them. I'll show a picture later. We have new crossings, we have new hybrids. They were all born in the country. So we have a huge diversity to play with, and it plays a role also in terms of climate change. And when I focus on the heritage grape varieties, you see the names here, maybe some of you have heard of Arvin, but most of you have never heard of Lafnecha, for example. Um, we have a huge historical diversity, and I made some statistics and these heritage varieties only cover less than 4% of the country. And I, I, I find it very sad because we have a, a, a long history, 2,000 years of history, and we only use 4% of it on the market. The rest of it is Pinot, is Merlot, is Chardonnay, and so on. I find it very, very sad. Oh, a bit of, of uh, advertisement. It, it, I wrote a book about Swiss grapes in French in 2017, and it's going to be uh, released in English in a few weeks. So this will be the new cover. It's not out yet. It will be in a few weeks, Swiss grapes uh, book. But what I wanted to show today is that these historical grape varieties that we have have been around since the Middle Ages. This is the chronology of the uh, mentions in the documents of these grapes. The first one was 1313. So it's a very old document uh, with grapes like Rez, Imagne, and then Completer, and so on. And I showed you also a diagram of the uh, climate change over the last uh, two millennia. And it shows that these varieties have been around since the Middle Ages and even before. And they have survived, and they are still alive today. And I, 
I bet, as I said this morning, I bet that we need to maintain them, we need to cultivate them, and we need to promote them. Because Chardonnay everywhere is not the solution. Local grape varieties, for me, is the solution. Why do I say so? Uh, probably Lilian will, will speak more about clonal and massal selection this afternoon, later on. But just basically, what we have done so far since the, the 50s and the 60s in Europe is clonal selection. We went in the vineyards and we selected the best vines, most often one or two of the best ones, and we propagated them. So we lost the diversity of all the rest. Before that, we were doing massal selection, which means you take almost everything. You just discard a few uh, vines that are not good, but you take all the rest and you, you, you copy-paste it, most likely. Um, none of this solution is good. The middle <clears throat> is the best. So what the, we are doing in Switzerland, we are doing a clonal massal selection. So we prospect in the vineyard, we select the best clones, massal style, and we um, put them in collection, we test them for sanitary purposes, and we conserve the clones, and then we give it to the industry. So far, I took the example of Arvin, which is one of the most interesting Swiss grape variety. Um, we have, since 1992, we have identified 109 clones or biotypes of Arvin by marking in the vineyard, virus-free, and multiplication. And out of these biotypes, 25 turned out to be very good for winemaking. And the nurserymen today are forced to sell to the customers, to the, to the growers, at least five clones randomly. They cannot choose them. And this maintains the biodiversity within the grape variety. And this is of utmost importance, so that modern selection is helping to conserve the biodiversity. Getting back to what I was saying this morning, the uh, rootstock influence, is very, very important. In this diagram, it, it, it was done in, uh, in Switzerland. In this diagram, we, we see the rootstock influence on potassium and on yield. And as you can see on the diagram here, uh, based on, on the, uh, these, these are the names of the rootstocks, you see the huge difference in potassium uh, intake based on the, on the uh, rootstock. And also the, the yields can be significantly higher with one rootstock or another. Also, um, magnesium deficiency is a, is a problem. We, we have limestone, we have a lot of, of, of uh, limestone vineyards, and magnesium deficiency is a problem. And you see here you have deficiency in magnesium very low for 41B and extremely high for Fercal. So depending on, on your choice of rootstock, you will change completely the behavior of your vineyard. It's very, very important. These studies have taken ages to be done, and a lot of money. It's very expensive, but it's necessary to do so. We can also play with altitude, because we have mountains. Uh, this vineyard is very spectacular. It's, if you ever go there, it's Vista Terminen. It starts down there at 650, and up there at 1,090 meters. It's one of the highest in Europe. And depending on the variety, you can choose where you want to plant it. In the future, we can, in every other region, we can go higher when we, we have mountains. And then I will finish with the, these few slides. I often hear people saying, oh, you need to uh, adapt grape varieties to the different terroir. You need to find the perfect matching between grape varieties and terroir. And by the way, the, these, uh, these infographics are very nice. This is Steve DeLong, my friend, doing that. And this is Wine Folly, Madeleine Pic uh, Pouquet, doing that kind of infographics that I, I like very much and I want to promote. Um, this is too simple. This is too naive. It's not true. The truth is more complex. The truth is you need to adapt. Every clone, this is Pinot, just a few. We have 1,000 of them. Every clone to every rootstock, this is the diversity of rootstocks, to every terroir. The combinations are huge, are almost infinite. But this is what we have to do to cope with climate change. So, in conclusion, 
what will happen in Switzerland in the Alps over the next 100 years. We will have, like everywhere else, an increase in CO2, which can be good because for photosynthesis you need CO2. And it also have, has a, a glass house effect. Temperature, colder winter, warmer summers, um, it will increase water stress, but also uh, it will help late ripening varieties to ripen better. So we, can, we should plant late ripening varieties. Rainfall will, will change, it will be an issue with irrigation. Diseases will increase. So what do we do? We increase chemical treatments, we plant resistant hybrids, what do we do? Open question. I believe, again, that historical grape varieties are part of the solution. They have plasticity, they have biodiversity that we can use. It takes time and money, but we must do that. For example, I, I took Chasla, our most planted white variety. It's very early ripening, so what we observe is that when it's too hot, too much water stress, you have herbaceous and, and bitterness that is unwanted in the wine. Same for Pinot Noir, you have cooked Pinot Noir, which is not uh, uh, desirable. And the late ripening varieties so far are doing well. So paradoxically, in Switzerland, we can say that so far, global warming has been positive. I know it's a bit shocking to hear that today. But we can say in this condition of Switzerland, with, 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 with the higher um, and cold uh, climate vineyards, so far, it has been positive for late ripening varieties, but it will not be the case in the next 100 years. So we have more regular harvest, uh, but we need to do more research on clone rootstock terroir matching. Do we need to plant what, what they call PV, which is the, the uh, resistant hybrids? Open question. GMO, big question mark. And th this, is, this is, again, my uh, focus on historical grape varieties. So, that's what I prepared for this talk. And to be smart, drink Swiss wines. <laughs> Merci, Josie. Um, before we start the questions uh, with the crowd and, and within you, I just have a question for all of you because all morning and this afternoon, we're talking about adaptation, clone, rootstocks, and so on. Uh, but the changes are happening quite fast. We see it from season to season. Um, what about the small producer? Can they survive? Because to make changes in rootstock, in clone, in all of that, it takes time. Like you keep on saying, it takes money. So I'm just wondering the financial reality for a small producer when they face with all of those challenges, how do they start and how do they survive? Are the government prepared to help? Just I think uh, m many, many governments are uh, helping with research stations doing the job. Of course, small producers cannot, cannot do these experiments. They are benefiting from this research. But also, you need to, to look further than next year. You need to, to look for the next 30 or 50 years. And these are long-term researches. And politically speaking, it's very difficult to defend. So it's easier to, to have a short-term project than a 30 or 50 years old project like, like it was done in, in Switzerland. It requires money, but y we do it for the next generations. I mean, uh, most of you are conscious that when you plant a vineyard, it's for the next generation, it's not for yourself. So it's forward thinking that we need. Gregory, you have something so to say? <coughs> I, I think that there is a lot of uh, sharing between uh, each uh, estate, each vineyard. Uh, so the most important can do a lot of research and development. It's what we we, we do. Uh, you uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, most old selection, and it for 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 us, I think it's a, a good way uh, because there is uh, more uh, rusticity, there, and we we can see that uh, the adaptation of uh, old uh, genetic old selection uh, are better against uh, hydric stress, but also against uh, disease. That means it's a good way to reduce also the spray and so, and uh, most all selection needs a lot of time and it's what we we started uh, it in uh, 2012. Now it's uh, it's okay. We have our own uh, most all selection, but we share it with other uh, vignerons and there is some uh, uh, group uh, who are uh, created and to to share uh, this knowledge. So that means uh, there is a reaction. And uh, the reaction if, is, uh, is uh, 
I think it's good for for uh, for the wine making for because it's a it's a it's a problem, but also it's a good thing because it's a, uh, there is a, like a, a lot of sharing. It's good. Grigory, I, I have a question for you actually. So um, every March or so on Instagram, uh, we'll see the post. You know, our hearts are with you, Chablis. You know, because of the spring frost, yeah. or our hearts are with you, Champagne. And obviously, we can all relate, you know, to the harvest dates, you know, uh, being uh, more and more premature or precoce, as you said, um, and the heat units, the increase in heat units. But what about, you know, this premature bud break, which is also a direct byproduct of warmer temperatures in February that leads to those spring frosts? Because it is not, you know, the byproduct at the end is not going to be uh, sensory. So it will not be like the sensory... Um, you know, issue of, you know, like a wine at a higher pH, you know, or, you know, like a perhaps, you know, lower quality. It could mean literally no crop. But so what, what we can see, uh, the, all the uh, effort uh, who, uh, was uh, done in the vineyard uh, uh, done a good job because our balance are good in the wine. It's but the date of harvest is also very important. That means we, we need to, to be uh, very reactive. Uh, we, we need to be re uh, ready before the, the summer to start at the good day, especially for the wild grapes. You know it, for, because the date of harvest is uh, one of the answers, because two days later, it's too late. So that means we, we, we have to take care of this. And what we can see in our uh, grapes that we, we can uh, harvest with a, a perfect balance. Uh, and that means we, we in, uh, in, a, in uh, 18, uh, it was uh, very uh, warm during the, the summer, very dry also, but uh, we picked uh, the grapes with uh, between 12.2 and 12.8 uh, and 5.5 uh, of uh, total acidity. That means, uh, there is a good answer of our uh, vineyard, so it's a, it's a good sign for the future. So not concerned about spring frost as a, so, as a byproduct of global warming? So, no, I think uh, so there is some uh, cycle of uh, spring frost. We, we didn't have any uh, spring frost uh, the last uh, 15 years, and uh, since uh, 16, it's... Uh, yeah, so, but what we can use now, it's uh, with electricity, it's a new system, you, you can imagine a, 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 a line with uh, electricity, and it works well, it's, uh, for me, it's more uh, ecological than to sp uh, spray water, because it's water, but also you, you can imagine that you, you, need, uh, you need oil and, and uh, engine to, to spray it, and it's uh, uh, more ecological also than, uh, than candles. So, but it's, uh, there is a lot of things, we try a lot of things, we, we, uh, we, uh, we start to prune later than before, later and later, we, we prune now in, in two times to, uh, to delay uh, the, uh, the starts of, of growth. So that means it's uh, the, the how practices uh, involve also. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions from the room. Any questions? We just need someone to bring the microphone. Hello, Gregory. Um, my question is um, linked to what uh, Mr. Delorier mentioned a minute, a few minutes ago. So, obviously, it's very marginal climate. It gets really cold in this part of the world, uh, and you're certified organic. But in the peak of winter, uh, when one has to, you know, tackle frost and burn smudge pots and butage, I mean, butage is, as, is a fairly old technique, but when you're burning smudge pots and you certify yourself organic, not, not just one producer, but the entirety of the region, can that be considered certified organic? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question? If we can uh, consider like um, widespread organic certification? That no, if burning smudge pots to, to sort oh. of protect the vineyard against defrost would be still considered organic if you're certified organic and still burning coal or whatever fuel to, to make sure the wines resist the test of time and, and cold. Yeah, well, we, uh, we have some bales of hay. Uh, we, we certainly don't burn coal, that's for sure. Um, and then um, as far as uh, you know, the organic certification, in, in our case, um, there's something really interesting in an emerging region. You are replacing an indigenous ecosystem and an indigenous uh, uh, fauna, uh, sorry, flora, <laughs> uh, an indigenous flora by indigenous, uh, by European genetic material. And you know, organic practices are strictly part of our di biodiversity effort in order to do that you know, like, uh, uh, in a way that is sustainable. Um, it, it, it's, it's really strange when you think about it. Um, you know, the Americas you know, were colonized uh, you know, uh, by, by Europeans. Um, so um, at the human level, there was you know, like something genetically not too dissimilar from replacing an indigenous um, uh, flora uh, by European genetic material. And if you're going to do that, the least that you can do is to do it in a symbiotic way. And that's why we, um, that's why we try to do it organically. And that's why we have a biodiversity program. Gregory, I think also the question was for you in terms of when you, in terms of the organic, uh, in Chablis, we see um, all types of things being used um, to, co to come back uh, spring frost. So, does it, in terms of the organic certification, do they consider that? <clears throat> so you, you you don't lose uh, the organic certification if you use it. Uh, what, what the question yeah. was. So yeah. you 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 don't lose the certification. So, but but keep in mind that it's uh, not uh, during uh, three months. It's uh, two, three, four or five uh, nights, and it's. Uh, uh, natural answer uh, uh, from the vigneron to try to, to save uh, the, the yield. So that means it's, uh, it's not easy, uh, but we, I think all the adaptations are here now to reduce these, uh, those practices. And as I said, the, the pruning, the, so there is a, a lot of things to do, the, the rootstock, uh, so many things are uh, done to, to reduce uh, the impact of, uh, of frost. I would, like Hello. I would like to complement the answer then. Well, it's important also then. You can be tilling the soil every second row. So it can be very natural. Only the heat going out from the soil with a lot of humidity will be protecting the vineyard. So every second row with grass, without grass, grass and without grass, in short, will help you to prevent. Also, you can be complementing, as Gregory was saying, like a late pruning, so they can delay the bad burst, so you can skip a frost. You can be including wind. If you have wind as well, they can have airflow, so you can diminish the impact. Uh, also, other areas, like uh, I know the Comité Interprofessional de Champagne, is working in different methodology to prevent the frost. I know the researcher uh, Pascal Potier, his Vasil Potier is working in different methodology. So we have different options. It's not only fire or only one way to proceed. We can pr uh, see the problem from different visions. Yes. Josh. So this is a question for Jean Benoit and, and Francisco. Um, Jean Bonnard, you just mentioned that you're working with European plants. And certainly in certain parts of the states, um, indigenous American vines are beginning to make some very good high quality wine. Whether there's a sustainable market for that is another question, but it's beginning to happen. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if in Nova Scotia or in these sort of very cool, mar what were once marginal climates, indigenous varieties, indigenous plants, are more um, adapted to the region you're working in and whether you see that that is a more, um, an, yes. easier, an easier viticulture to work with. 
Absolutely, and it would be a thing of beauty if we had, uh, you know, true indigenous material uh, or true indigenous vines in Nova Scotia. We don't. Uh, we, we do have hybrids, so maybe there is a bit of a parallel with that renaissance that you're talking about uh, in the northeastern United States, which I think is a thing of beauty that is illustrating that there is uh, a change uh, in the metrics, you know, by which wine is valued, and um, I think uh, before, um, there was a bit of an apartheid of varietals, right? And um, uh, the sensory experience, obviously, like with all its subjectivity, was really key and demand and all that. But now the focus is how the wine is made. And there lies like a tremendous opportunity for solutions as well, because when there is, a, you, uh, as it relates to you know, uh, the carbon footprint, for example, uh, I think that the equation of how the wine is made can be a path, you know, like to, you know, some really creative solutions. Um, and um, uh, we'll call it, I, I hate to use that term, but we'll call it like, let's say like the, the natural wine movement in its transition from a grassroots movement to something that is about to have a global impact. Um, there, is a, there is a very interesting parallel between that and the evolution of wine as a byproduct of human evolution and the evolution of you know, the ecosystems uh, where they come from. And um, wine made its way you know, for, you know, in, in, the, you know, in you know, the human experience for 8,000 years because it added a tremendous amount of value, added value to the quality of human life. But those metrics are changing and that's what we were talking about uh, you know, with the David Suzuki Foundation this morning, the metrics by which quality of human life are measured are changing, and we can see it with the beef. You know, that's a great example. You may love beef, but you may not be able to um, you know, like indulge you know, like as much as you used to when you were driving a Hummer to go to the keg. Good example. Just to complement what Jean Benoit said, well, for us, what we have in Nova Scotia quite special is a variety, a hybrid called Lacadie Blanc. Lacadie Blanc is a, a hybrid which was bred in Ontario. And the first result of Lacadie Blanc in Ontario was like around the 50s, 60s, and they didn't have the best results. But the variety was adapted very well to Nova Scotia climate. In the last three years, as I, as I was explaining before, we are doing a terroir study. So we have Lacadie Blanc in different soils with different climatic characteristics. And it's very interesting to see how this variety, depending where it's growing and it ex the exposure and how it's, it's, it's the amount of precipitation, can produce wine with different char characteristics. So the Lacadie is like our flag right now, I think, in, in Nova Scotia, which is for the steel wines or even sparkling wines. So, Nova Scotians are very proud of what they are producing and how green they are, because as it's a hybrid, doesn't require as much applications of sulfur or copper. So we can continue producing in a very environmental friendly way. I have a question. In 2019, Nova Scotia uh, officially had a tidal bay as an appellation. Was it in 2000, sorry, 2000 and 2011. Thank you, my goodness. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. It's been I a long day, 2011. Yes. Um, today is 2019. Um, when you were planning this, you knew the changes were coming. You've been talking about you having a bit more uh, Vitis vinifera planted now, but a lot of the grapes used to make Tarot Bay is, is hybrid. And it's also meant to be very light, fresh, high acid, low alcohol but it is now in Appalachian. So how do you foresee this to keep with the style that it's set with the change of climate? Well, there was actually a really interesting question that was asked to us yesterday in the master class on Nova Scotia. And um, it was based on something that a lot of you are familiar with, which would be you know, the, the emergence of these uh, new um, kind of cult projects, you know, like in Quebec, uh, Domaine du Nival, Les Pervenches, uh, Pinar et Fille, La Garagista, which, you know, some of those names may resonate with what you were referencing uh, a few minutes ago. And um, the question was, uh, with, you know, hybrids, you know, now that you don't have to hide them, you know, like, can you replace Tidal Bay uh, by, you know, varietal wines because you don't need to hide, you know, like their, their content and their presence behind an Appalachian name. And I thought that that was a really interesting question, highlighting 
these changes that are uh, before us. So. Mm, yes, I think we have a lot of options in the viticulture management because, as you know, the, vine the wine is starting the vineyard. So if we can change a little bit how we are doing the canopy management, and then we can select and choose vineyards in different locations, we can get like continue keeping the freshness and also the flora, all, all the citrus aroma. So it's mainly how we are deciding to work in the vineyard and then making the blending. We have a lot of opportunities to continue improving. Thank you. Any further questions for this panel? Thank you very much.